Four men and two women turn up at a guy's door in the neighborhood of San Francisco, flashing badges in front of his face. He presumes they're cops. He answers their questions and even lets them search his home. They're looking for a phone, a very important phone. Something just isn't right here. This is the story of the sketchy secret police force working at one of the biggest companies in world history. We'll come back to that important phone later, but first let's have a look at how Apple got in the secret policing thing. Back in the day, people called them Jobs Mob, in relation to the departed CEO Steve Jobs. An even more ominous epithet was the Apple Gestapo. None of these names were actually nice sounding, but they're fitting considering what Apple got up to while everyone was thinking it was such a cool company. Apple itself called its police the Worldwide Loyalty Team. This team was given the name the Apple Gestapo by employees working for the company, but the name was admittedly an exaggeration of what the loyalty team did, but only because they didn't ever torture people into making confessions. However, the loyalty team wasn't as benign as the name suggests. Think about it. Institutions such as the Gestapo, or for that matter Joseph Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, often had one thing in mind when they followed a person and sometimes in the dead of night, abducted them and then took them to a small room for vigorous questioning. They wanted to know, often with some amount of torture involved, how loyal the person was to the country. Apple wanted to know the same, although the person being followed was usually suspected of leaking company secrets, not government secrets. A former Apple employee talking to Gizmodo said about the loyalty team, Apple has these moles working everywhere, especially in departments where leaks are suspected. Management is not aware of them. He explained that if someone in a certain department was suspected of leaking information, Apple wanted to keep them inside the building. The secret police would go to that department in the early morning and arrange an operation. Once all the staff was in the office, it would be announced that all employees should remain seated at their desks. At this point, the workers were told they shouldn't have a toilet break. After all, they could throw something into the bowl or remove something from their phone. At this point, none of the staff would have known that Apple's loyalty cops were in the building, saying that when they they were ordered to hand over their phones, some folks would have likely become quite suspicious. These phones would then be examined. Yeah, this was a day at work, not something you'd expect to happen. If the employees had iPhones, all the data from the phones was uploaded to another computer. Since Apple gave phones to its employees, most of them had iPhones. If these phones were locked, the secret police demanded that the owners unlocked them. Gizmodo wrote this, They backed up everything and go through all the phone's text messages and pictures. If you have porn on your phone, they will see it. If you have text messages to your spouse, lover, or Tiger Woods, they will see them too. Just just like that, no privacy, no limits. And now you're starting to see just how paranoid Apple was, and is, as a company. But this is just the beginning. While all those checks were going on, the employees were told they could not use their computers. All PCs had to show screensavers. The cops didn't want anyone sending messages out while the operation was in process. Employees were even told that they shouldn't chat with each other during this time. You're now thinking, if that was me, I'd just grab my phone, give the police guy a piece of my mind, and leave the building. Some people might have done that. But you have to remember that working for such a cool company was perhaps one of the best gigs in the world. It's like in the dystopian novel The Circle, which was based on a fictional super high-tech company with some rather shady secret police. Just like in the book, the Apple employees were so grateful to work at the company that they'd have done nothing even when things started to look unethical. Maybe when the author of The Circle, David Akers, wrote the fictional company's motto, Secrets are lies and privacy is theft, he had Apple in mind. If they suspected someone leaking secrets, Apple's secret police might also have taken a line from George Orwell's book, 1984. Basically, the cops would have said something along the lines of, we shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. If the person at Apple really did complain and not hand over their device, they were offered a deal. The deal was get up now, collect your things, walk out that door, and never come into the company again. Your number is up, and if you try and enter the building in the future, we'll have you thrown out. Oh, and by the way, you'll be hearing from our lawyers. That former employee said he experienced this firsthand, and some people had their devices checked and were then whisked off for what he called an interrogation. That would usually include the person being told to come clean or some kind of legal action would be forthcoming. Why Apple would act like the Gestapo is simply because it didn't want any other competitors knowing what it was developing. If that should happen, it could be very costly. Many companies are paranoid about this, but as you'll see, Apple takes it to another level. Apple's secret police won't disappear a person if they think that person is a spy or just poses a threat to the company, but it might break the law and go to great lengths to plug a leak. This brings us back to the Apple cops visiting that guy in San Francisco and impersonating a real police officer. The man in question was named Sergio Calderon, then 22 years old. In July of 2011, it was reported that one of Apple's prototypes for the iPhone somehow ended up in the Kava 22 bar in San Francisco. The phone was supposedly priceless, given that such a prototype could make its way to a country such as China, where another company might copy the device. The cops arrived at the guy's house in the Bernal Heights neighborhood of the city and told him, hey Sergio, we're from the San Francisco Police Department. They said a phone they very much wanted had been tracked back to this abode. Thing was, they didn't say they worked for Apple, so the guy thought they were police officers. Once inside the house, they pretty much went through everything and then told Sergio he'd be given a $300 reward if he could make it somehow reappear. 
appear. It was also reported that the officers tacitly threatened Sergio's family with deportation if he couldn't produce the device. He later told the media one of the officers is like, is everyone in this house an American citizen? They said we were all going to get into trouble. One of the people that was there that evening said his name was Officer Tony. He turned out to be a former cop named Anthony Colon. With Tony and another Apple cop were some actual police officers, but get this, what happened that evening was never officially recorded. Sergio later said he'd never allow Apple staff to search his home if he had known the truth. You can't not record a search like that, so that led the San Francisco police to issue a statement saying, this is something that's going to need to be investigated now. If this guy is saying that the people said they were SFPD, that's a big deal. It was a big deal. Apple was acting like the authorities, and companies are not allowed to do such a thing. There was no need for it either. Prior to the case, Apple had searched for a phone, but not by itself, but with a police task force working on behalf of the company. We'll come back to that messed up story later. It turns out that the operation involving the search of Sergio's house was the work of a former FBI agent named John Theriault. He was the head of the Apple secret police at the time. He was the one that gave the order that day. It was said that he was hired by the paranoid Steve Jobs. But after Jobs went on to live for eternity in the cloud, Theriault left the company and Apple cleaned itself up and stopped being so darn heavy-handed. Theriault announced that he'd retired, but the word on the street was he'd been forced out of the company after what had happened in Bernal Heights. Once Sergio knew what had happened to him, he got himself a lawyer and sued Apple. That's when Theriault announced his departure. A person familiar with spying and the matter of the lost phone said, my gut tells me that a company does not lay off or induce somebody to quit while it is potentially being accused of wrongdoing led by that person. That person could end up being the best witness against them. We don't know what happened to the phone in the end, but it might have been sold on Craigslist for the price of 200 bucks. If that's the case, someone really had no idea just how much money they could have made. They probably just thought they had an iPhone that didn't quite work right. As for Sergio's case, it seems that the matter was settled out of court, so he could have made himself a good chunk of money. Neither he nor his lawyer David Monroe would comment on the matter, which leads us to believe that they signed an NDA with Apple. It also seems the phone never did get into his hands, so all that cash he earned was deserved. Now for the story of when Apple did use the authorities in the right way, but was also accused of heavy-handedness. This involved the case of a lost prototype for the iPhone 4G. It was mistakenly left at a German beer bar in Redwood City, California in 2010. The two people that found the phone apparently tried to give it back to the owner, but when that didn't work out, they sold it for 5000 bucks to a tech journalist named Jason Chen. Chen subsequently published the details and photos of the phone for Gawker Media. Apple cops later visited him at his home, but when they were denied entrance, the company contacted the California Rapid Enforcement Allied Computer Team. Those guys used a warrant to search the house and take all of Chen's computers and anything else they thought was related to the phone. They didn't even tell him if he was a criminal suspect. The New York Times later said what happened could have been called misappropriation of lost property, adding that it's a crime but not a theft. Steve Jobs, mad as anything alive, said it was extortion. Although when the case went to court, Chen and Gawker came out without a scratch. The sellers of the phone didn't serve a day in prison but were put on probation. Still, many people claimed that under the 1980 Privacy Protection Act, it is illegal to search a journalist's home. This just goes to show the power of Apple. Now, some more paranoia. We've mentioned the departed Steve Jobs a few times already, a man that some people treated almost like a god. Sir Jobs was the knight of the techno realm when he was still with us, but he was perhaps also a dark knight. He was undoubtedly good at his uh, job, maybe, as some people said. He was maybe the greatest CEO of his generation. But after his departure, as the fanfare died down and people stopped crying to songs played on their beloved iPod, a good amount of jobs-related blasphemy filled the air. He was called rude, hostile, manipulative, a bully, spiteful, and among other not very nice things, an extremely paranoid fella. On top of that, his precious products were made by people in China who also worked on godly hours in terrible conditions for pitiful wages. These folks were named the eye slaves people who worked with safety nets in factories lest they get funny ideas about clocking out for good. Jobs also created a culture of fear at Apple, the kind of place where secret police were needed. At times, though, Jobs didn't need that team. Sometimes he was scary enough all by himself. One such instance was when he met a journalist for the Wall Street Journal to talk about his new iPad. The meeting had to remain behind closed doors, and some people at the journal who thought they'd be privy to the information were locked out. One person that did talk to Jobs was an editor named Alan Murray. He could have had no idea what he was getting himself into. You see, after the meeting, he took to Twitter and wrote what seemed like a harmless comment. He said, this tweet sent from an iPad. Does it look cool? The tweet was sent from one of the new iPads, but there was no leak going on at all. Nonetheless, Paranoid Jobs was reportedly furious about this, the vein in his neck almost ripping apart his black turtleneck sweater. Murray was later asked if this was true, and also asked if he knew why Jobs had exploded. In an email, he only said, I will say that Apple's general paranoia about news coverage is truly extraordinary, but that's not telling you anything you didn't already know. All this guy did was write a tweet that simply said he used the product. What do you think happened in those days if you said something bad about one of Jobs' products? You should ask a man named Ken Steinborough from Liverpool in England. One day, his daughter handed him her new iPod and told him there was some 
something wrong with it. He picked it up and it started hissing. I could feel it getting hotter in my hand and I thought I could see vapor, he later said. He then threw it out the door and onto the lawn where it hissed some more, exploded, and shot 10 feet into the air. The iPod had turned into a bomb. Not a great look for Apple. After making a complaint, he received a letter from Apple. He said the company offered him a refund but denied any liability of his player turning into a potentially deadly device. He also had to agree to a vow of silence. The letter said, you will keep the terms and existence of the settlement agreement completely confidential. It added, if somehow news got out about what had happened to him, this would happen. Apple will seek injunctive relief, damages, and legal costs against the defaulting persons or parties. He told the British media that this was a kind of life sentence, seeing that if he did one day make the mistake of saying something, he could potentially be ruined. In his own words, he said, if we inadvertently did say anything, no matter what, they would take litigation against us. I thought that was absolutely appalling. Too right it was. Now, you really need to watch What If Apple Was a Country, or have a look at 10 surprising ways the government is spying on you.